So a few weeks ago, I mentioned that Debbie, the boys, and I spent many a Thanksgiving with Debbie's sister and her family in Clinton, Connecticut. Debbie's sister Mary and her husband Dick are the parents of two children. The oldest is Rich, who recently moved from Florida to New Jersey. Yes, I said that right, Florida to New Jersey. And Sharon is the mom of the six-year-old Caden, whose picture I showed in a message back in August. Now, we started making those trips when Nate was in first grade, and the last one was Nate's sophomore year of college at Lafayette. So there were a lot of trips for Thanksgiving. Now, somewhere along the way in those trips, Rich had graduated from college, but had yet to start his studies, his graduate school studies. So he was working a couple of jobs, and one of which was as the, an assistant football coach at Xavier, where he had attended high school. Now, in Connecticut, Thanksgiving Day is the day for the big rivalry high school football games. Unless the home school had lights at their field, and then the game would be played on Wednesday night. So, does it surprise any of you to know that many of those Thanksgiving trips included visiting some high school to watch a football game while we were there? So I remember one particular year when Rich was coaching at Xavier. They were playing on a Wednesday night. I don't remember exactly how cold it was, but I'm pretty sure we were all sitting in a very large walk-in freezer. It was one of those nights where I watched the steaming steam coming out of the hot chocolate when it was being poured into my cup. But by the time it got from here to that wall, it was already cold when I started to drink it. But the weather didn't matter to me. You see, earlier in the day, in a Joe Namath right before Super Bowl III type moment, Rich promised me that Savior was going to win. No doubt, Uncle Mike, we're going to win. So the game gets going. And by the end of the first half, Xavier is losing. Making matters even worse, there was no band to entertain at halftime. So all of a sudden, I'm getting cold. So halftime comes at an end, and teams come back onto the field. As luck would have it, we're sitting relatively close to the sideline on the same side of the field as Xavier's bench. As Rich was walking past where I was sitting, I decided to play the pain in the neck uncle. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever done this, but Rich is walking by, and remember, there's no band playing to drown out my voice as I yelled, Hey, Rich, you promised! Rich kind of went like this and kept on walking. So today we wrap up our time with Moses and the Israelites. Our lectionary folks told us, or made a very interesting selection for us today with the second half of chapter 33. See, the reading is a small piece, one scene, if you will, of a three-act play, or three, acts, cha three chapters from chapter 32 to chapter 34. And they've given us just this one little snippet. So now, two weeks ago, we heard God giving Moses the commandments and the people the commandments in chapter 20. After this, Moses goes up the mountain and begins to receive instructions from God. These instructions are laws on the relationship between God and the people and laws on the relationships between the people and each other. Once he's finished, they're finished with all the instructions, then God starts giving Moses the instructions on how to build the tabernacle and what the priests should wear, what their vestments should look like when they're, when they're making the sacrifices in the tabernacle. So these instructions end in chapter 21. So we've gone from chapter 20 all the way to chapter 31. And God hands Moses the two tablets to carry down the mountain. Apparently, this conversation went on for quite a while. You know how it is. You just stepped outside for a minute to ask the neighbor a question, and the kids were playing nicely in the living room. Your one question led to another question. It led to another question. 
And all of a sudden, you're in a full-fledged conversation. And then you realize you can't hear the kids playing anymore. You know, in those cases, quiet is not a good thing, right? Anybody else been there? You go back in the house, and I'm sure many of you can fill in the rest of that statement. So chapter 32 now opens with the people figuring Moses abandoned them. So they told Aaron, make a God that's going to lead us. So Aaron makes the golden calf, and the people have a big festival in the calf's honor. Now this is where God takes notice to what is happening, and God is not a happy camper. God's ready to take out his wrath on these folks and then start nation building all over again with Moses. He's had enough of them. Now this is a section of the chapter where some really interesting parental language is found. God sees what's going on and says to Moses, look what your people are doing. And Moses looks back at God and says, they're not my people, they're your people. You know, how many of you had those, you know what your son did today? Conversations? Well, this is what's going on here between Moses and God. Moses tells God that God can't destroy the people. What will the Egyptians say? Moses asks, what about your promise to Abraham and Isaac and Israel? And because of Moses' plea, God changes God's mind. Calm, cool Moses takes the two tablets and heads back down to the people. When he reaches the people and sees what is happening, Moses goes ballistic. He throws the tablets on the ground and breaks them and takes matters into his own hand. Then the next day, Moses tells the people, you know what? You really messed up big this time. Let me see if I can go back up and straighten this out with God. Moses pleads his case before God. God tells Moses to lead the people to the place I have told you about. My angel will go before you. And eventually, I'll punish those who I choose to punish. So now chapter 33 opens as God tells Moses again, take this people to the land I promised Abraham. I would give them, but I am not going with you. I am sending an angel. If I go, I might consume this stiff-necked people. So the people heard this, and they mourned. Meanwhile, Moses would take his tent outside the camp and continue his meetings with God. In fact, verse 11 tells us that Moses and God used to speak face-to-face -face as one speaks to a friend. So now our text opens with Moses replying to God's statement that God was sending an angel to go with them. Moses is really displaying some chutzpah here. Moses is not having this idea that God is not going with them. Why? What do you mean, God? You promised. God, you promised you would lead us all the way to the promised land. Don't give me this stuff that you're sending an angel. I'm not having that. God, hearing what Moses said, said, Okay, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So now here's where things get a little confusing. And you heard Ron say it. God says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses says, if your presence will not go, do not carry us from here. It's like, Moses, weren't you just listening? Didn't you just hear what God said? Well, the problem is, God didn't say that. Scholars tell us that the original text said, my presence will go. As years went on, the grammar police said, no, 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 that's not the right way to end that sentence. So they added the phrase, with you. The original text said, my presence will go. Moses' response then was saying, no, 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 you're not going ahead of us, you're going with us. So that's why Moses responded the way he did. Moses 
like most of us would, was looking for some clarification. Now Moses isn't finished yet. If you're not with us, God, you're no different than the Egyptians or anyone else. It is you, God, who make us distinct. So then God says, I will do everything you ask. So now at this point, you think Moses would quit, right? God say, I do everything you ask. God's going to be with Moses and the people, and he's going to lead Moses and the people to the land of milk and honey. So why wouldn't Moses quit? But he didn't. Moses says, show me your glory, I pray. And now here's where God draws a line. I will make my goodness pass before you, but you cannot see my face. No one shall see me and live. So God puts Moses on the cleft of the rock, and God's presence passes before Moses. Now I need to tell you, scholars are still trying to figure out how come in verse 11 they talk face to face, and in this verse, no one can see God's face. They're still scratching their heads trying to figure that out. So here we are now, 2,600 years or so after this text was written. And what do we do with it? How are we impacted by this ancient story? And how do we apply it to our lives in 2017? Now, if you recall, when Moses encountered God at the burning bush, and God told Moses to go and rescue the Israelites, Moses asked an interesting question. Moses said, what do I tell them if they ask me for your name? And God said, tell them, I will be who I will be. So here we are 30 chapters later, and Moses continues prodding to discover God's character. Because of Moses' prodding, we now know that God will be gracious and show mercy. The text reassures us that God's deepest character leans toward grace and mercy. And friends, that is good news. Because of Moses' prodding, prodding, we now know that God chooses to live with human beings. Moses has nudged God step by step to reveal enough of God's character to find a way forward that allows the holy, gracious, glorious, powerful, and good God to live with us without destroying us, sinners though we may be. So God, the creator of the whole universe, whose glory we see all around us, chooses to abide with us. Now think about that. God is making God's self vulnerable to the pain that comes when relationships are broken. God feels the pain when we fall short. And when that happens, it is God who is ready to extend grace and mercy. So friends, God also knows the pain we feel when our relationships fall short. Since God chooses to abide with us, authentic communication is possible. We communicate with God. Moses provides the example of how we can do that. Moses is the model of prayer. Prayer that is not afraid to hold God to God's promises. Prayer that is not afraid to appeal to God's love for God's people. Moses, through his audacious prayer, succeeds in securing God's promises that God will indeed abide with the Israelites on their journey and with us as we journey through life. God is with us. Do we approach God as Moses did? Do we approach God with the same unreserved freedom as Moses? We can learn a great deal from Moses. If we follow Moses' example, we know that we do not have to be passive and submissive when we are praying. We can approach God directly, honestly, and yes, bluntly. But like Moses, we have to know when to stop and listen. God will respond in a selfless way. God will extend grace and mercy and the assurance of God's presence. The good news of this story 
is that life keeps going after the calf, after the idol. God stays with the people and propels them forward on their journey. God's mercy extends even to idolaters. The text made clear that God was incredibly angry at the idolatry. But the purpose of the anger is to restore the people to the right relationship, to provide a fresh start under a renewed covenant. The same holds true for us. We, too, can start fresh with God. In the second half of that football game, on that cold Wednesday night before Thanksgiving many years ago, Xavier came back to win. So Rich kept his promise. In that tense time thousands of years ago, God kept God's promise to abide with God's people. That's a promise that God con continues to keep today and will always keep. And friends, that is very good news. Amen.